and the fact of the matter is, and I, and I don't care which system you use because th there are tropical astrologers who get great results and that that can be for a few reasons and I can get into those, but the planets are not in two places. The stars are not in two places. They they are where they are. It is a it's a mathematical fact. It's an observable fact. You can go up in the sky. So if, if you're going up in the sky and you're seeing like right now, for example, Saturn is in Capricorn. But you know the tropical system. They're saying it's a, it's in Aquarius. You know, and then they're drawing conclusions based off of that. Well, it's not. You can you can go up because we have to remember astrology first and foremost is based off of the science the mathematical science of astronomy so if you can look up and see that oh saturn's not in that constellation it's not in aquarius it's actually in capricorn well you know what i mean that that's where it is it's not it's not anyone's opinion it's just that that is the observable fact so for me if i'm using the science of astrology and I'm supposed to be basing it off of astronomy and then using that to create a map, which I use to interpret things about someone's life. To me, I sure as shit better have an accurate calculation to begin with. Otherwise, my conclusion that I'm drawing is going to be incorrect. You know, and that can, you know, again, as those charts <clears throat> get more and more apart over time, the accuracy of that Western system is going to diminish up until a point like where where it reaches you know it's it's height and then it will slowly start moving closer you know closer back into accuracy over another period of another twelve thousand years and eventually it'll align for a short period of time and then it'll it'll repeat the same cycle mm -hmm. if if we were to con continue continue to use the two different systems that's how the cycles would go where they would kind of they would revolve around each other yeah just really that you know don't don't ever shun or dismiss a science until you you've properly studied it and tested it so if you're a person that you've kind of just thought astrology oh no that's just something woo woo that's that's fake and you're basing that conclusion based off of like the little horoscope you see in the paper understand one that's not astrology it is a vast science and it takes years of study and research. So unless you've done that, don't don't dismiss it. Like be willing to actually look at it with an open mind and be willing to test it. Because if you're willing to do that, you're, you're likely to be able to find one of the most valuable tools you could ever apply to your life. And I very much encourage everybody to if they don't want to study and become astrologers themselves, at, at least be willing to find a professional astrologer whose insight that you value and get a consultation from them and see what kind of insight they can help bring to your life because it, it might just be something that that radically shifts the way you look at yourself and your purpose in this world all right and welcome to the Vani podcast the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self-liberator's paradise. Uh, as always, that website is Pasnia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com. Today, we venture back into the realm of spiritual self-liberation. But before I bring in my guest, uh, a brief introduction. Uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, the best pointer I've gotten in my objective of uh, reversing my so-called type 1 diabetes came from Phoenix Aurelius, a uh, gentleman who practices spagyrics and medical astrology. Uh, one of his colleagues is a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner and uh, was able to pull off the, the so-called incurable. Uh, since that point, I've opened my mind a lot further uh, and explored some of these, uh, these sorts of topics that I would have never given credence to before. Uh, as, I've passed on, as I've also passed along, uh, I recently received immense value from past guest Lindsay Sharman uh, in one of her healing ceremonies, and uh, more recently a Vedic astrology session uh, from Brian Easterday, who just so happens to be my guest for today's discussion. Uh, that said, as is the case with most things, uh, the realm of astrology isn't just one monolithic field, and not all schools of thought are created equal. Uh, the Servile Society has certainly uh, laid out plenty of uh, nonsense and misinformation in this area to deter individuals away from the value that can be added to one's life uh, by an understanding of the sky clock. Uh, this would uh, possibly bring up the tropical versus ideal astrology debate, and uh, in regards to today's guest, uh, Vedic astrology, a branch of Ayurveda, a, method a methodology I've become quite interested in. 
and uh, back in the Ayurveda traditional Chinese medicine days, and possibly there might even be still some of these clinics out, out east. Uh, you weren't a real doctor if you didn't also know and understand astrology, too. Uh, and yeah, they, the doctors also had their own, uh, you know, herb gardens and stuff. Like, they, they made their own medicines as well. But uh, yeah, I guess uh, how far have we fallen? Uh, after all, when removing the mystical elements, uh, which can sometimes be helpful and useful, we're really talking about timing and the influence of energy at various angles uh, here within our electric universe. Uh, so today with my guest Brian Easterday from the Wizard Factory, uh, we'll talk the basics of astrology, uh, compare and contrast the differences between tropical and sidereal, and why he chooses to use the latter, uh, what can be gleaned from an astrology chart in regards to life and liberation, uh, the rundown on Vedic astrology, and uh, whatever else we happen to get into today. A um, couple quick notes from a current read uh, that I'm diving into myself. Uh, it's called Essentials of Medical Astrology, uh, part of a uh, Vedic astrology series by Dr. K.S. Chirac. Uh, and uh, these just short two quotes will give you a little more of an idea of what, I guess, at least in the, in the Vedic astrology, medical astrology realm, um, I guess some of their, some of their views. Uh, For the one balanced in food and recreation, who is restrained in his actions, whose sleep and waking are regulated, there ensues a discipline which destroys all ailments. And that's from Gita V1-17. And uh, this other brief one. uh, Disease, undesired happenings, excessive physical labor, and disassociation from the objects of desire. Uh, These four causes, these four cause physical torments. And that's from the, oh gosh, the pronunciation here. Mahabharata um, Aranya Parva, Chapter 2, SL22. So, yeah, certainly a different perspective uh, on things. And uh, that's one reason I appreciate it so much. So uh, without further ado, Brian, welcome to the Vani Podcast, my friend. Uh, How are you doing today? I'm pretty good. Thank you, Shane, for having me on. Not a problem. Um, I'm excited to do the discussion. Um, And yeah, as far as those those quotes go on on the two books, the uh, the Mahabharata is like a um, a larger uh, epic or or text that is kind of giving a story. And then the Bhagavad Gita is an excerpt or a one chapter from that. So that'll that'll clarify for the guests like cool. where those where those are coming from. Yes, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, that was something I tossed mm-hmm. in at the very last minute. I guess I could have could have gone in and looked into that, but uh, um, yeah, oh, yeah, appreciate no, it. No worries. <laughs> Definitely appreciate it. So yeah, the yeah. Uh... <laughs> right, go, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, man. Oh, I was saying the the Vedic texts are definitely uh, a subject that can get a. Uh, a little bit confusing sometimes because there there's so many different ones written in different time periods so uh i always like to try to clarify so it's if people do go try to look it up it's easier for them to navigate to that yeah yeah def- definitely and uh again you know going back to the i guess the the fact that you know astrology is not just you know like one field um within vedic astrology then this essentials of medical astrology book there's like four different charts there's a north indian one a south indian there's like there's all sorts of ways to approach it um, and I guess everyone has their, their own preferences and perspectives based on, on, on their experiences. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a massive field. It's a massive field. And, uh, um, yeah, I'm excited to dig more into it today. So uh, I guess, uh, but first, Brian, uh, I guess, would you mind by uh, beginning with a uh, brief introduction? Uh, who are you? What do you do? And uh, I guess tell us a bit about uh, your path here. Sure. So uh, over the last, you know, I I come from a background, a general occult background in in hermeticism, teaching cosmic law, um, Norse paganism, and and in really type of animist or uh, pagan philosophy. Uh, When I was first beginning my my teaching path, Vedic astrology was kind of one of the tools in my toolbox that I was using. But over the years, as I've researched more and more and and done more consultations and things it's really kind of developed into my my passion and my focus which is one of the reasons i i was actually i'm in the process of rebranding actually and i'm no longer doing anything on the on the wizard factory uh so if people are wanting to continue and follow my work my my new channel eye of the storm astrology that's actually premiering november 16th at 3 45 p.m so um I have it set up to premiere and everything because I still have a few little things I'm putting in place, but that that'll be coming out here, you know, in the next week and a half or so. Um, so, so I'm moving my focus more in towards uh, focusing just on Jyotish, just on Vedic astrology, um, and the the area I like to focus on most. If if there was to, if I could quantify it into kind of one overarching area. Uh, for me, the development of the soul and the consciousness, uh, the karmas a person has come here to experience, their dharma, those those are the things that fascinate me most about a chart. You know, some people are very into 
um, you know, predicting when someone's going to get money or, or whatever that may be. And, and those things have their place. But for me, the most fascinating way to use this science um, and, and that's what it is. It is the science of all sciences. The most fascinating way to use it is to to see why we came here, like as a soul, as an Atma. What are our karmas? What are the lessons we're here to experience? And how are those going to help us develop and expand our our consciousness and our awareness? Um, be, you know, one thing I always say is that awareness creates choice. Like you could summarize everything going on in the universe. There's awareness creates choice. So awareness, consciousness, and choice, free will go hand in hand. And for those of us who are wanting to create more freedom in this world, it's absolutely essential that we begin with that education process, that awareness, because then we have more ability to exercise our free will, to exercise our choice. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's definitely true. And I, I remember um, in the in the reading that you did for um, for me, uh, you mentioned and, and I thought it was a, a really, really valuable insight that, um, you know, like you're you're not injecting like, you know, like these characteristics are like you're, you know, what you are, who you are isn't bad. Um, but it's basically how you decide how you decide to, um, I guess, how you decide to act, uh, act on those things. It can be it can be good or it can be bad. Absolutely. So, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm absolutely. Right. Every every planet sign placement combination has has a higher expression and a lower expression and it's you know the that's the whole purpose of astrology is to create that awareness so we then have the choice to you know act from our highest self or to uh try to be the best version of ourselves that we can be yes yes definitely definitely and this ties into like this would tie into kind of the natural law um i guess area too and uh that's kind of where i i came to came came at this this came at this from is um kind of the you know the, the mm -hmm. anarchist perspective uh, uh i guess the first presentation i really watched on natural law was obviously mark passio's where i think a lot of people's um introduction to that subject was mm -hmm. and uh then obviously his he, he goes uh you know much more in depth on, on other things which you know other related subjects um yep. and uh you know I've, I've always found that that highly valuable um so i guess uh, um you come from that that same sort of perspective the liberty kind of natural law area too if i if i if i yep. understand correctly so could you could you speak to that and how that ties into yep. uh what you do Abs absolutely yeah so you know cosmic law universal law they are those are the things which permeate everything so for me and and this is where i kind of differ a little bit as a vedic astrologer compared to traditional ones is uh within the the vedic system they teach all of the hermetic principles are taught they're just not called the hermetic principle you know as above so below all of that's in there in, in its own version in the original sanskrit so when I started uh, looking at the lessons within the Vedic system and seeing that, oh, you know, this is, you know, these are the exact same laws. These are the same understandings. They just, you know, they're not calling it the hermetic principles or, or natural law or whatever. They're just referring to these as just this is the way the universe works. So when I realized that and then as I started studying charts and seeing it, I, I actually found that Vedic astrology was by far the most useful science available to to a cultist or, or as as human beings for the study of cosmic law you can you can go through the signs and see the play between the masculine and the feminine you know the internal and the external and and i do different videos where i i kind of break these things down um in even in, in my uh learning the foundations astrology course that i I taught my ver one of my very first sections I started with is why Vedic astrology is a study of cosmic law. And I went through each of the principles and, and showed how we can view those and see those in a chart. So to me, there, there's something that is inseparable that if, if we really want to have an understanding of natural law of cosmic law, in my opinion, Vedic astrology is an essential study because there, there is no other science that allows you to see cosmic law in its entirety and understand it in such an intricate and detailed way um you know you're you're looking at the macrocosm to understand the microcosm and through the microcosm understanding the macrocosm like that's li that's literally what astrology is like astrology is literally the the study of the principle of mentalism it's the study of the law of correspondence mm -hmm. like you can go through each of them and and every single one is included and it, it's utterly fascinating to me because when you 
you start to view astrology through that lens, you get so much more out of it than the traditional way through which astrologers look at and interpret a chart. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I guess the, the element that I found interesting, especially with Ayurveda, is um, that, uh, you know, you mentioned natural law, you know, cause and effect, karma, these these things. Um, I guess my, you know, obviously, the, the general perception is that, you know, you, you, um, you know, you, you send and you go to hell or you send and you, you know, you go, you go to heaven or whatever. That's kind of the Western perspective. But you tie in Ayurveda with it. And it's not like it's not just like a one life, one life's journey and it's over. It's uh, um, especially with mm -hmm. Ayurveda. I mentioned on this podcast before that type one, so-called type one diabetes, one of the the variants, you know, one of the classific, one of the many subclassifications. Uh, unlike Western medicine, which just classifies it as just you know one type one diabetes, is it? Um, they have you know twenty some classification subclassifications and four main classifications, and one of them, um, the juvenile diabetes, is is related to um, pat like past life sins or sins of parents. So like. That's kind of that's an interesting angle too. Is that like and, and it kind of lends credence to that like um, you know um, you know where it's I guess here to correct things too, right? Um, here to 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 correct correct things that have, um, to to balance out that 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 uh, you know that that's uh, the effects that we had uh, in previous lives per se. A absolutely, yeah. The you know the Vedic um, definitely is based off of the the understanding you know that that we are an atma, that, that we've always been, you know, there, there's always purushara and prakriti, the, the masculine and the feminine, the, the observer and that which is observed, the experiencer and that which is experienced. Cause to have an experience, you, you have to have an experiencer. There has to be a consciousness there to have that experience in the first place for that consciousness to have that experience in the, in the first place, it has to have something in which to experience. So Purusha and Prakriti, the, these are, are timeless and mortal. They have no beginning, no end. And this is the same understanding that modern science has when we say energy can never be created mm -hmm. or destroyed, destroyed. It's, a, it's the same thing. This is what Krishna is talking about in the Gita when he, when he's telling Arjuna, uh, the nature of reality. And that there, there are these things. Um, and when you see that and you see the, the purpose of everything is the development of conscious. It's to experience so we can learn, so we can grow. Incarnation is the only thing that really makes sense when you logically think about it. And you can look around in nature and see various things through which to see this. You know, like you can, you can see that the sun rises every day and that it sets every day. You can see that the seasons change. You can, you can observe death and rebirth everywhere you look. Mm -hmm. um, but our karmas, you can think of them as a, uh, they're, they're the effects to our actions. Cause if, if we're the experiencer in order to ex uh, experience, we, we have to, we have to do something. If we do something, if we take action, that's a cause we've put out. Because we've put out a cause, there's an effect we have to experience. And it's this cycle that builds. It's like you could think of um, our karma, and, and this is a, a very good way to understand like free will and karma, in that free will by its very nature kind of limits itself. And, and this is why. Because if we exercise our free will, we take an action, there has to be a reaction to that. There has to be an effect for every, every cause has its effect. So imagine you want to go to like a restaurant one day. So you get in your car and you, you start to, you know, you pull, pull out on the road. So you have initiated some motion in order to go achieve that action. There's some momentum starting to build there. And as you're driving down the road, you decide you want to get there a little bit faster. So you hit the gas pedal. Now you're speeding up faster and then you may get distracted and all of a sudden you see that restaurant you're wanting to turn at, but it, the, the turns right there. And if you were to try to just slam on the brakes and turn, you're probably going to wreck. Well, many times this is, this is kind of how our, our karma can be. We can, we have the free will to change our karma, but we also build up momentum. So when we put out so much of a cause we have to deal with those effects because those are there. So in that case, if we wanted to get to the restaurant, we would have to slow down the car. We might have to go down to the next turn and turn around and come back, you know, and then turn in, you know, and that's just like life. You know, someone might be, they might, you know, be an addict or something, right? They have a lot of momentum built up on this path and it's not, 
you know, some people can slam the brakes and maybe do it, but other people might have to slow down and try to make the turn, you know, because we, we've built up that momentum. So we have to deal with the effects of that momentum and then try to put new causes out there so we can start experiencing new effects, but it's not an instantaneous process. So this is what every lifetime is, is us dealing with the effects of all our, all of our actions that we've done the momentum of all of that and then trying to figure out how how can we learn the lessons from these so we can then start to steer that momentum in a conscious way to actually achieve the goals that we want to achieve and get to the destination that we want to reach right right exactly exactly i'm, I'm, I'm right there with you and, and i guess the the next question i which i think the listeners will certainly appreciate is is in which we've we've kind of already talked about and it's uh, it's definitely on a larger scale picture a uh, better understanding of uh, you know the the universe and the world we find ourselves in but um i guess uh, uh what value has vedic astrology brought to your life specifically if you could speak to that oh wow <laughs> that's a Big i could question. speak for a while on that one so I mean, first and foremost, knowledge of the self. It, it was something through which not only allowed me to understand myself, but start to actually love and accept myself to see where, you know, where were my strengths and where are my weaknesses and how, how could I turn a weakness into a strength? How could a strength that I was using actually have been a weakness because I was misusing it? Gaining that self-awareness was you know, I, you couldn't ever put a price tag on something like that. And then secondly, you know, awareness of others, because when you can go and look at your chart and understand that you can then go start to look at other people's charts and see them in an intimate way. And you're not, you're not looking at the, the body you're, you're looking at someone's soul, like the path of a soul that through hundreds or thousands of lifetimes has built up this momentum to have this experience in this incarnation. And you are look, you're looking at the essence of that. You can see the, what karmas they're going to experience and when they're going to experience those and what are the lessons for that. And it's, it's like being able to see the most beautiful, like, and put together the most beautiful puzzle you could imagine. Um, it's absolutely invaluable and, and obviously in being able to understand the self and others that, that is understanding the universe itself. Okay. So it's, you know, there's, there's no area of life astrology can't bring insight into, I mean, I, I apply it in my business. I apply it in my relationships, my parenting, the everywhere, because it's, it's a universally applicable science. And, you know, it's life would not be nearly as rich without the understanding of it, at least from my perspective. To me, it, it just makes things so much more beautiful because you can, it's like you can see all the threads in a tapestry and how they all come together in order to actually give that picture of reality. And mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, just what a beautiful thing to be able to see. Yeah. Certainly, certainly. So I, I guess we should probably get into some, some nuts and bolts here. Um, uh, so I sure. guess, uh, basics of astrology, uh, and, and I'll, I'll let you, you kind of feel, uh, you've, you're, you know more about it than, than I do, but you know, maybe some, some definitions, you know, I know a lot of the, the common, the common ones, transit, transits, oppositions, etc. Um, kind of give us, uh, you know, the, the Vedic astrology, or I guess just astrology 101, and, uh, then we'll kind of, uh, get more specific as we go. Okay. So, yeah. Um, yeah, as far as 101 goes, if you're just wanting me to get into kind of like the the basic components of what make a chart, mm -hmm. um, the basic components would be one, you have uh, the houses, which the houses, you know, and I'll try to give just a very short, brief explanation of each. The houses, there's 12 different houses because you, you're taking the sky, you're splitting in it into 12 30 degree segments. So you get 12 houses. Each house is associated with a different area of your life. Then you have what are known, what we call the Rashis, or these are the, the common zodiac signs that everybody knows, Aries, Taurus, you know, Gemini, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, you then have the Grahas, the planets, um, 
and in Vedic astrology, we use nine of those, although there are neo-Vedic astrologers that also include the outer planets, but in the traditional school of thought of Vedic astrology, we count the seven visible grahas, the ones you can see with your eyes, and then also Rahu and Ketu, which are the north and south node of the moon. Um, but those aren't actual, they're not real planets, they're mathematical points on where the um, where the solar and lunar ecliptics cross. So where, you know, the sun goes below the ecliptic, that becomes the south node of the moon when it passes, you know, on its path, and it goes below the ecliptic. When it goes above, it becomes Rahu. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have those. Then we also have what are known as nakshatras. So the Rashis, the regular zodiac signs, the this is the zodiac belt, or it's the, the path that um, the constellations that the sun cross goes through at, on its ecliptic on the solar ecliptic the nakshatras are lunar constellations so these are constellations that the moon goes through on its ecliptic and you can kind of one way and this is the only way you should think about them because nakshatras are just a huge huge subject in, the, in and of themselves but one way to think of them that is helpful is kind of like the gears behind each of the signs, each of the Rashis. There are two and one quarter nakshatras um, behind each of the Rashis. So this is, understanding these will kind of help people, like when if they're coming from the tropical or the Western system, many people will say, oh, I was born on a cusp. So I kind of feel like this sign, I kind of feel like that sign, I don't really know which, which I am. More than likely it's because they were born in a nakshatra that actually bridges between those signs. When you see the signs go from masculine to feminine like for example like aries is a masculine sign it's associated with the element of fire and then taurus is a feminine sign associated with the element of earth there's an ashatra kritika which goes between those well why would that be because it it helps it helps as like a transition f from the masculine to the feminine you know and, and vice versa and then there are three areas within the chart where there that it just stops suddenly and those are known as gandata points but that's kind of another subject um so you have these nakshatras here as well. And the nakshatras will really give you the essence of something because, you know, two Leos aren't going to be alike. You know, they could be, you know, they could have be in a Maga nakshatra or Purva Falguni or Tara Falguni. Um, so e each of those have their own flavor. So it's just, it's important to understand that each one of these things that we have in astrology is like a layer of information. And then by looking at them all together, you can you can start to assemble you know each of them will have their own qualities and then you start to assemble those together kind of like when you're cooking and you have a bunch of different seasonings and then you you start blending a little bit of you know uh salt and a little bit of pepper you know or wh whatever the seasoning may be in there and then based on the ratio and the combination of those seasonings that gives it its unique flavor it's the same thing with an astrology chart you know it's kind of like uh looking at your cosmic, you know, the cosmic flavor that, that you are as, as an individual. Um, so those are the, the basic components, you know, uh, again, Vedic astrology is just, we have so many different things because we, we also have like the Varga charts, the divisional charts, like the Navamsha and the Shatamsha and things like that, where they're charts that look at specific things like career, marriage, and that type of stuff. We, we have Dasha cycles, uh, we have yogas, which yogas are planetary combinations, and they we've recognized that when there's certain planetary combinations or certain exchanges happening in the chart, it can create what's called a yoga, which it like it means to bring together, and that yoga will deliver a certain karma. Like you know, for example, there there's yogas for wealth, so you could see that in someone's chart, and you could see that okay, so they have a dawn yoga, they could potentially get some wealth. So then you you can the yoga can tell you like what karma. But then we have like Dasha cycles, which are planetary time periods. The Dasha cycle will tell so the yoga tells you what the Dasha cycle tells you when, you know, and then we, you know, we have other tools for evaluating that and qualifying whether it's going to be like a little bit of wealth or a lot of wealth and, and things like that, that go to. So it's, there's so many tools I, I couldn't just begin to really name them all, but, but the basic ones for a simple understanding would be the. The houses, the Rashis, which are the signs, the Grahas, which are the planets, and and the Nakshatras. Those those would be the 
big four that if you were wanting to start looking into Vedic astrology, that that is where you want to start. Unmute myself on the on the recorder, um, but yeah, and I guess I should mention that uh, I've, I've I I it, and I I don't have a, an under I couldn't I can't read charts myself I I don't know all the all the definitions and where especially especially with just like sidereal astrology not even talking about you know um, Vedic astrology where you kind of have to have a, you have to learn a second language kind of it seems um, and it's it's a whole different yes. it's, it's a whole new like especially just the med- just the medical astrology thing it's like it's a new study like it's it's starting from from ground zero for me so um, I guess mm-hmm. uh, um, there's um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, you don't have to, you know, be able to do all these things to, to, to gain value from, um, to, from Vedic astrology or, um, or, or, uh, yeah, you know, just astrology, not astrology generally. Um, not that you, not that you, you couldn't yeah. or shouldn't, but, um, but, uh, you don't have to, it's not, uh, it, 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 it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be that complex. It's why we have folks like Brian who can help us, uh, um, help us, uh, break these things down. So, um, it, and, and, well, and even within, um, the Vedic, What's really important to understand about Vedic astrology is that it's <clears throat> it's not just astrology. It's it, that is just one arm of the Veda, or you know, it's known as the eye of the Vedas because it's it's what allows it's what allows vision, it allows consciousness to see. There's also o- other arms of the Vedas which focus on uh, how to speak properly, etymology, th- those type of areas. So it it's really a holistic approach to life and astrology being one right. area within that and then within astrology is a huge number of sciences but even for the a person who doesn't want to become a, a vedic astrologer reading the bhagavad gita or looking at those things they they explain the it's more than just astrology they're explaining the essence of life so there's value for anyone even if you aren't necessarily wanting to study vedic astrology specifically uh there all of the vedas all that knowledge is still there so it's not only limited to astrology so just to clarify for people on that that even if it's not that's not the science you're wanting to look at there's still lots and lots of value like you said shane that you could you could glean from this uh school of thought right right and 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 ayurveda i think is the science of life right um so um yeah ayurveda is yeah like the focus of like just medical astrology uh being the healthiest you can be you know bringing the the sciences of yoga and astrology and you know healthy eating and all these things kind of together into one holistic practice yep Yep, definitely, definitely. So, so um, I guess the uh, I said it doesn't have to be complex, but I know like I, and it's it seems it's it's anyway anyway. Um, this this brings gets gets into the tropical and sidereal discussion. I didn't know there was two. I didn't know there was two of them, but I was listening to a podcast and uh, I it was it was uh, Athen Comente was on there and he was like. Uh, it's like, yeah, so like, uh, you know, if you look at tropical, such and such might be entering this sign, but that's not actually what's happening in the sky. Like, that's not actually, that's not actually what's occurring. It's actually in this sign. And it's like, I was, I was like, hold on a second. What's going on here? Like, so, so the, what's going on? So I, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't quite sure if tropical was a scam. Kind of was kind of my initial inclination. Um, holy shit, is that a scam? Of course it is. But I'm not sure if I'm there anymore. But um, I guess... I've heard that. Um, I, I guess I've heard that. I've heard that tropical is highly effective when it comes to like three D and material things, um, whereas sidereal or Vedic astrology is more for, as you were saying, like more like the life and soul type things. Um, so I guess uh, I'll, I'll kind of turn it over, turn it over to you. Um, I guess could you talk? I guess speak to the differences between tropical and sidereal, and um, I guess uh, if there's any role for tropical in your view. Sure. Um... So yeah, that that's this is a, a huge discussion in itself. So I'll try to do it justice in in a, a short short period of time that, <laughs> to where we don't get too far off into it. But if you want to look at the the essence or the basics of the difference, it's that the the two systems calculate the zodiac differently. So the tropical system uh, places the beginning of Aries like March twenty first on the vernal equinox. So it <clears throat> is more kind of aligned with the seasons. But we have to understand when you're studying astrology, the seasons on earth aren't the thing that we're studying. We're trying, we're trying to study the sky. So sidereal astrology is based, sidereal means it's based on the stars. So how we do our calculations in sidereal astrology and, and there are different schools of, of thought in this, but to, to keep it basic here, we use what are known as called, called as ionamsas. So an ionamsa is where 
we're calculating the apparent movement of fixed stars over a period of time. So there are certain stars that we can we can measure these off of different, and these are Yogataras, which are like the main stars that are within nakshatras. So these stars are what we call fixed stars, and in, in the fact that they don't move, they're they're there, and we we can measure them consistently. So that's why we use that as our foundation. And we have to keep in mind that everything, the whole universe is moving. The whole cosmos is spinning and moving and projecting itself through space. So if we're basing the exact same measurement every single year off of off of a season, we're, we're not going to have an out, accurate calculation all of the time. Most of the time, actually, we won't have an accurate calculation. We will a very, very small portion of the time if we do that. Um, so the these stars move apparently move backwards one degree every 72 years so this get this is where you get the difference in the tropical and the sidereal and right now it's currently at about 24 degrees but again in you know rough roughly 72 years just for easy demonstration of the point it'll be 25 degrees and then another 72 years it'll be 26 and so on and so forth until it moves all the way across. So it takes an entire, uh, entire Yuga, tw entire like just under 26,000 year cycle for, for these two zodiacs to actually become completely aligned. The last time they were aligned was around 2,000 years ago. So the, the two zodiacs, when like the Greeks were using their astrology, um, and then Indians obviously had, had, had their astrology for quite a while those two zodiacs were aligned for a while and that's where we can actually see the adoption of the rashi system um that actually came from like uh arabic or middle eastern astrology and both the the greeks and the indians picked up the rashi system from that whereas previously the indian astrology vedic astrology had been a lunar based uh astrology based on the nakshatras but then they they saw that it worked well and then they pinned the two systems together and then you know, from there, they've kept up the calculations with the movements of those fixed stars. So, you know, uh, roughly, you know, 12,000 years or so from now, you know, the tropical system will be complete. It, it'll be completely opposite. You know, they'll say that, you know, oh, the moon's in Libra, but really the moon will be all the way on the other side of the sky in Aries. You know, and it's not that way right now because this is something that happens over a long period of time, but it is it is 24 degrees off. So. And the fact of the matter is, and I, and I don't care which system you use because th there are tropical astrologers who get great results and that, that can be for a few reasons and I can get into those, but the planets are not in two places. The stars are not in two places. They, they are where they are. It is a, it's a mathematical fact. It's an observable fact. You can go up in the sky. So if, if you're going up in the sky and you're seeing like right now, for example, Saturn is in Capricorn. But, you know, the tropical system, they're saying it's, it's in Aquarius, you know, and then they're drawing conclusions based off of that. Well, it's not. You can, you can go up because we have to remember astrology first and foremost is based off of the science, the mathematical science of astronomy. So if you can look up and see <laughs> that, oh, Saturn's not in that constellation. It's not in Aquarius. It's actually in Capricorn. Well, you know what I mean? That That's where it is. It's not, it's not anyone's opinion. It's just that that is the observable fact. So for me, if I'm using the science of astrology and I'm supposed to be basing it off of astronomy, and then using that to create a map, which I use to interpret things about someone's life, to me, I sure as shit better have an accurate calculation mm -hmm. to begin with. Otherwise, my conclusion that I'm drawing is going to be incorrect. You know, and that can, you know, again, as those charts <clears throat> get more and more apart over time, the accuracy of that Western system is going to diminish up until a point like where, where it reaches, you know, it's its height, and then it will slowly start moving closer, you know, closer back into accuracy over another period of another 12,000 years. And eventually it'll align for a short period of time. And then it'll, it'll repeat the same cycle. Mm -hmm. If, if we were to continue, continue to use the two different systems, that's how the cycles would go where they would kind of, they would revolve around each other. 
But uh, that's, I, I think, at least a short, basic explanation yeah, of the main difference between the two. You know, again, there's there's a whole lot more to, you know, like in the Vedic system, we also have mythology and mantras and, you know, again, a lot of the other tools that I was talking about that just tropical astrologers, they, they just don't have those tools available to them. Uh, the tradition hasn't been as well preserved as the Vedic culture has, where it's been passed down from guru to student over and, you know, for, for thousands and thousands of years. And, you know, it's really based off of, that's why the language of Sanskrit is so important. Sanskrit, literally, it translates to the perfected language. It, it That's why it is so essential and important to understanding it, because that's, languages can change very easily. Mm -hmm. You know, so the knowledge can be lost in in the ebb and flow of time. But if you can have a language that that stays perfect and that you pass that knowledge down, it allows that knowledge to be preserved in a more pure way. And that's that's it. That's what we're dealing with in Vedic astrology. Um, so it's it's not just that we have the correct mathematical calculation; it's that we have so much history and and language and other tools and just so so many other beautiful things to go with it that it, it's just it's such a richer system you know or at least in my opinion yeah yeah and that's 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 that was a yeah a terrific terrific explanation that was that was my my viewpoint too if like if, if we're studying nature right if we're observing nature then and you're not observing nature then like i, I don't know uh but so yeah that just it seemed right. like, it seemed it seemed off to me immediately right. it seemed off to me I immediately Right. A good way to think about it would be like if you um, had someone like you say you were going to like look at the weather. Right. And someone was saying it's going to oh, it's going to rain, you know, and then you're basing you're basing your decision of, oh, I need to get a raincoat or I need to be inside or whatever based off of that prediction. But what if the guy was calculating the weather for, you know, a state that's away? Yeah. Well, that's not the same weather you're going to have because the calculation's off. You need to look at the calculation of where you are and prepare according to what you are going to experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's also interesting, too. We are just uh, in the Pasnia Committee Correspondence Chat, someone brought up, uh, you know, a different language, you know, potentially, you know, a, a different language outside of English, which um, I'm kind of coming to the conclusion that it's basically just spellcraft at this point. Um, but uh, I was like, I've, yeah. I've, I've had the, I've had the, I've had the desire for like months now, like I want to learn Sanskrit and I want to learn Latin. Like those are two, two languages that I really want to learn. Yeah. Um, getting back to, and I guess this would be another reason why I, I, I wanted, I guess I wanted to read, like, I, I, I wanted to, I want to be able to see and read the Bible, um, just out of curiosity, like in, un, as, as untranslated as possible. And same thing with, um, I, with sure. this Vedic astrology text. Um, cause yeah, obviously, mm -hmm. obviously things are very, you know, things are very easily corrupted. Um, and, uh, and the further, yeah, the further absolutely. you get away, the, the further, the, the further you get away, the, the more bastardized it seems it gets. So, um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I guess absolutely. that's another reason to read, to learn Sanskrit. And I guess I knew that, but I didn't, I didn't make the connection, but, um, yeah, <laughs> um, very good. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I certainly appreciate that, that, uh, that overall explanation. Um, and, uh, I, I guess we're, we're kind of on the same page. Um, I don't really, I didn't have an explanation like that, but I just, it just seemed off. It seemed off. Um, so I guess the, the follow up question. Well, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so that's all it takes is that, that little bit of critical thinking. And then you just start observing like, like, just like you said, well, if we're observing nature, shouldn't we be observing what's actually there? Yeah. Yeah, you know, exactly. That's, that's the sidereal. Exactly. So then, I, I guess that the follow-up question I had on my notes and, and, and is basically: So, do you see any need for tropical astrology? And it sounds like um, there may, like, or maybe there is for the time when it overlaps and it's useful. But otherwise, uh, um, otherwise, uh, not really. Is that kind of the kind of what I'm, I'm getting? Um, I I wouldn't necessarily go and make a, a total blanket statement like that because I there are some wonderful tropical astrologers i'm i'm good friends with some very wonderful tropical astrologers and and they do have their own things uh in there that are useful that you can you know especially and you know one area i'll give credence to uh, in tropical astrology is they're bringing in the use of the outer planets more you know of neptune your uranus and pluto um they very much use those a lot more. So I, I think a lot of great research on those uh, grahas has been has been done through the field sure. of tropical astrology. Um, but I, I think there are some reasons why, just if there are very good tropical astrologers, why they get the results they have. So 
one of the, one of the understandings we come to in Vedic astrology is that people, you know, we have karmas, we have this momentum built up in life, and it may be our dharma or our karma to be an astrologer. In fact, astrology is it's such an advanced science that w without previous life karmas and works towards it, you're not going to be a Vedic astrologer. You know, you're you're not going to be an astrologer at all. It's a divine science, so you have to have a lot of good karma built up in that, you know, to, to be able to really find your way into the science and to find a good teacher and those type of things. So people who are great astrologers that are practicing through the tropical system, they very well could have just past life karmas to be a healer. You know, they, they came here to be a healer or they, they could be repaying, you know, they could have harmed people in a past life and the way they're repaying it. in this one is by being able to give, give them that reading. So, what we have to understand with astrology is it's not just only a left brain science to be a good astrologer. You have to have an intuition as well. You have to be able to feel the subtlety in a chart and, and see, feel like, cause you can see, you can see a million different things in a chart, but what's that thing that you need to say, mm -hmm. right? You know, they may not, they don't need to hear everything. They may just need to hear that one thing. So that's where the intuition comes in. So, many tropical astrologers who are, are doing brilliant readings and things it, a lot of that is going to be due to just intuition it that they have the karma the dharma to to be a healer to be able to help people and that they may have that karma with that person that contract that this is they were supposed to provide that service to that person in order to, to help guide them mm -hmm. and what they may be saying may be what that person needs to hear at that time like i i get so many clients that they've been familiar with the tropical system, you know, for years and years, sometimes decades, they've been practicing it and it was useful for them during that time. But then they come and they'll get a consult from, from me. And then all of a sudden their, their minds just blown and they're like, Oh, this just, there was all this and that was useful, but I see how, how this is all lining now. This is much more clear, you know, and, and you can see that in, you know, a, a good way to do it is to just take your own birth chart. You know, look at a tropical birth chart and then look at a sidereal birth chart. And, and you, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not telling anyone, I will never tell anyone to just believe me. This is a science and a science means it can be tested and the results can be verified. So go test the two systems, you know, see which one resonates more, you know, and, and keep in mind to truly test Vedic. You have to, you can't, you can't test Vedic astrology through the simple lens of tropical astrology. And I don't mean to be insulting when I'm saying that. But tropical astrology only has so many tools. They only have so many layers, so much so that they've, they've lost the essence of a lot of things. You know, they don't have the yogas, the divisional charts, the nakshatras, like all, all of that stuff is missing. So there's so many more layers of information that with the Vedic that, that you can see and you can see how that lines up. So you really have to truly, truly actually test both systems and see which one works for you. But time and time again, I, I get the results from people that, that it's the sidereal is what they end up getting. You, you can even see a lot of different professional astrologers out there that they started in tropical astrology for a while. And then they found out about Vedic astrology. And once they learned about it, they immediately switched because it, they, something clicked with them of like, oh, this is, this is what I really need to get into. Yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 definitely it's definitely different. I'm not sure if you've uh, I came across something called Human Design um, on a podcast a while back, and I you know did the you know I, I put in the information, looked at the chart, and it was fascinating. They had you know all sorts of cool explanations, and uh, then I came across it was probably like six months later another podcast is so, some guy was like yeah you know I built this I built an actual Human Design built based off of sidereal, so I went and put it in, and it's totally effing different. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, it's it's certainly not. Uh, <laughs> It's uh, certainly not the the simplest thing, um, and the, 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 I guess the the, the simplest. Right. There, there's lots of uh, lots of uh, I guess lots of confusion. At least there was for me, uh, but uh, maybe not confusion, more so clarification. But uh, um, yeah, and mm. I guess the uh, oh gosh, um, I don't remember where I was uh, where I was going to go with that. But uh, I guess the the <laughs> next the next thing that, that I guess the um, and I wanted to, I wanted to kind of make this more even more concrete for for, for the listeners uh, even beyond what we're talking about now. And I kind of mentioned uh, alluded to it in my introduction, but 
Um, so you're familiar with spagyrics, I take it, um, I guess the, the, uh, um, alchemy of the plant kingdom. Um, well, the reason I bring it up, I mentioned Phoenix Aurelius, um, is, uh, like when you incorporate things like Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine, like we're not just talking about, you know, these, these, um, you know, these out there influences, like they don't really have an impact down here as we've, as we've been talking about, but like traditional Chinese medicine, the planets all have organ correspondences. Um, and, uh, you know, mm. the various plants and herbs that they would use for, use for treatments, um, a lot of that is based off of, uh, off of timing. So, um, maybe, maybe the best time for this particular formulation, the, the plant needs to be planted at this time when such and such is in such and such, um, or maybe, and then maybe it has to be harvested at, at the full moon or, or whatever. Like we're talking about timing here, right? Um, you yeah. know, the, the timing and, you know, when, mm -hmm. the, what, what, what energies the plant has accumulated in that time on earth and when the best time, you know, to, to harvest that for the, for the medical purpose. So, um, yeah, I mean, Absolutely. Fundamentally, we're just we're talking about timing here. So I, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on that. Actually, I I love that you brought that up because you you can actually see that with the Vedic astrology, there there's actually because it, it takes place over the period of thousands and thousands of years. Like this is a very it's a very very old science. So originally in the Vedic system, the Vedas, how astrology was used, and and this is why it was a lunar based. It was a nakshatra based um, system is that it was all about that was the whole purpose of it was timing of when to know when to do the yagna when to do the ritual the sacrifice you know of w whatever it is so like you said harvesting you know when the moon is full and it might be in the you know shatabhishek nakshatra or you know whatever the case may be that all the the purpose of astrology originally was to it, it was the calendar it was all about knowing where we are in time and space so we know when to do the ritual and so we can do that properly so we can align with things and we see that even still today you can go to um you know like any little place that sells like magazines or something like that and you'll see a copy of a farmer's almanac well that farmer's almanac will have like phases of the moon and things mm -hmm. in there farmers like to this day will still plant according to the phases of the moon mm -hmm. think, well why is that? well because it has an effect you know, so this, that was the original purpose of astrology for in, in the Vedic context. And then as it developed through the years, it became more about also being able to apply that in a psychological way and to be able to create a horoscope and then uh, look at astrology for, as that type of tool. So there's actually kind of two different schools of thought with that, that there's the earlier school of thought, which is all about using it as a calendar and timing and to know when to do the, the rituals properly, the later school of thought being how do we apply this psychologically and use it for the development of the soul? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, um, I guess, uh, to, to get, I, I want to talk a little bit, talk more about, uh, I guess your, uh, what, I guess your application specifically, um, of Vedic, astro of, uh, of Vedic astrology, if someone were to do, a, to do a reading with you, um, I know, uh, in the couples reading that, uh, um, that, that I did, um, you focus a lot on masculine and feminine. So I guess, could you talk a little bit about your specific approach and, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, uh, we'll, we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah. So I have. You know, I, I do, I offer different types of consultations, you know, I offer anything from like, like you mentioned, like relationship consultations for couples. Um, uh, I do like a Ruta Lagna readings, you know, business consultations um, and stuff. But my, my general overarching goal and area of focus that I like to focus on is the path of the soul. Like, what's the essence of this person? Why did they come here? What are the karmas that they're here to learn and experience? And like, how are they here to go grow? Like, what's their dharma? What's their purpose? That's, to me, that's the most fascinating subject that I, that I like to get into. Um, so a few of my different consultations are based around that. But for example, like in the, the relationship consultation that you had gotten, uh, you mentioned that I, I start with an, an, an analysis of the masculine and feminine. Um, and you know, for the, for the viewers, the way you go about doing that is, you know, each planet, each Rashi sign, nakshatra, those all have, uh, they're either associated with masculine or feminine, you know, and then they also have elemental associations, which correspond as well. So you, you go through and you look at all the pieces of like, okay, so I've got, I've got some masculine pieces here. Okay. I've got some feminine pieces here. Oh, I've got a lot of masculine pieces and not so much feminine. So I can see that this person's going to have a strong masculine energy. 
the reason why I start there in a relationship consult, because, well, what is a relationship but a play between the masculine and the feminine? Mm-hmm. You know, if you're looking at a traditional relationship, even even in like um, like homosexual relationships, it's still play between the masculine and the feminine. You know, there's still going to be a, a person who is the more masculine type of person and a person who's the more feminine type of person because those that's how those things work. You know, the masculine, the masculine, like two masculine energies tend to just try to compete with each other mm-hmm. versus, you know, uh, a feminine energy which tries to receive that masculine energy. So, so in a relationship, to me, that's the most obvious place to start is analyzing how are each of these people functioning as an individual in regards to their masculine and feminine uh, energy do is it easy for them to balance that within themselves because some people might have a really good balance of it in their chart so for them it's really easy to balance their left brain and their right brain you know to get those hemispheres working properly but other people might have a lot of really feminine energy so they might be really stuck in the right brain or vice versa you know they might have a lot of masculine energy be very stuck in the left brain so you need to look at that person as an individual then you have to look at like okay so how how do these two individuals interact and then how do they interact together how does their synastry you know come to point so then you look at the what are known as synastry points or you know karmic connection points uh and those those type of things so you know every consultation has its different area of focus you know for different reasons but again, if there was like, I, I, I do, I, I absolutely, I love giving uh, relationship consultations and things because I, I love talking with couples. I think, I think it's really fun and it, it's a type of consultation I'm good at. Um, but if there was like a, a favorite area that I had to pick, definitely, like I said, the, the path of the soul, the Dharma, like the purpose of why we're here, the karmas we're meant to experience, like how we're meant to grow in our awareness that, for me, that's the most fascinating area of astrology, at least currently. But, you know, um, Jotis is a vast ocean. And, you know, as as the years progress, I I'll obviously shift my studies through the different the different areas. But that's definitely one I think will always be very prominent for me. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I can I, I can certainly recommend uh, um, the, the couples, um, the couples uh, chart or the couple, couple session that was, uh, you know, very, very valuable. Um, it definitely was valuable. And um, I guess uh, um, and this this kind of question, which we, we kind of already touched on a little bit, but I, I want to I, I'm, I, I kind of I'm, I'm curious about it. And it'll yeah, relate to the next uh, the next question or I guess the next thing we'll do. Um, so obviously, like tropical astrology is a lot of you know like day to day horoscopes or um, um, or even um, a sidereal astrologer I follow, Athen Comente does you know weekly sidereal. It's not the it's not the I, th- I think I, I compared it with one of the medical astrology book. And I think you use the North Indian one at least with the couples one, um, but he actually uses kind of the round typical tropical one. It's sidereal, so it's it's they're not equal houses um, or equal signs, but mm-hmm. um, he he does kind of the weekly the weekly version of that. So I guess. Um, does does Vedic astrology work for like the day to day and kind of week to week um, stuff like that, um, oh, or is it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You can get down to the like the specific hour that you want to do things, or or even minutes. You know, depending on how how advanced of an astrology you are. Um, that's what like the daily uh, finding the best time to do things. That's what we call Mohurta or Mohurta. Um, so that kind of is uh an evolution of that kind of first phase of astrology that i was studying is finding the right timing to do things so yeah there's lots of vedic astrologers that they'll do monthly or weekly forecast or daily forecast everybody kind of does their own thing some people like focusing on on forecasting more than others like i i do like to do it but again like for me it's i i really like looking at the individual um that being said when i'm doing things like a uh, historical case studies like one that i'll be releasing on my new channel is like a, a historical case study of like the berlin wall so i'll actually take that and then over that whole 30 year period that was up I'll, I'll be looking at all the different transits and the things that were kind of like going on during that time period and, and applying that so um yeah you absolutely absolutely can apply it for a a daily forecast or weekly forecast or however you're wanting to do that. That's, that, that's absolutely uh, possible and, and very, very common. That's a, a very normal thing for Vedic astrologers to do. Okay. Very, very good. And then uh, I guess tying in with uh, this, this next thing, I guess to, to kind of conclude with, I'm sure the, the listeners would, you know, appreciate, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if, uh, if you'd be willing to pull up a chart for say tomorrow, November 10th, 2021, 
and uh, sure. give people an idea of what what you see when you look at the chart. And uh, then maybe even if you could send us like a, send an image of that over, and I'll include it in the show notes too. Um, that'd be that'd be fantastic. Yeah, yeah, I'll take I'll take a screenshot and uh, shoot it to you after after sure. we get done here, so you can throw that up. Um. So uh, we'll take, go ahead and take a screenshot of that now. Okay, so to start off, uh, for, you know, first big thing that I'm seeing is that we have uh, both, you know, Saturn and Jupiter and the Moon are all going to be in Capricorn. So, you know, that that's going to be a very strong Capricorn energy because Saturn is the ruler of Capricorn. So. You know, Capricorn is a sign that's symbolized by the seagull. So it's all about hard work, discipline, focus, getting organized, those type of things. And, and Saturn is the planet that makes us, it puts pressure on us. It makes us have to work hard. He he brings our karmas to us. Saturn's the planet of cosmic law. Uh, so we so we have that energy going there. And anytime the ruler of a sign is in the sign, it, it really brings out the karmas of both planets. It really in, it brings out the energy because it's like you're getting a whole lot of the same seasoning in a dish. That would be mm -hmm. one way to look at it. You know, then we also have Jupiter here in Capricorn where uh, Jupiter can kind of become debilitated in Capricorn, but where what helps here is that it's actually sitting with the ruler of the sign. So it, it kind of does cancel that out to some extent, but it's, it can kind of be a play between two different energies here because you have Saturn, which likes to, to put pressure and kind of crush things and Jupiter, Jupiter expands things. So it can sometimes have this feeling for people or like people in the world, they'll ha be having this feeling of, Oh, I want to get disciplined. I want to expand in my life. I want to grow my awareness. I want to learn this kind of thing, but oh, I have all these responsibilities of life or, oh, I would like to go out and travel in the world. But, you know, there's this pressure of these lockdowns happening that are keeping me from doing what I want to do. You know, that would be like an example of, of how that could play out. And then moon being in Capricorn as well. Um, that can be a, a good place for the moon, although the moon's not necessarily always as happy there. Um because Capricorn's a very serious sign, and the moon's a soft planet. It it wants to enjoy things. It's a sensual planet. So, but this can make it to where you know, collectively, our minds, because the the moon is associated with our mind, um, and our emotions. Collectively, our mind and emotions would be getting a little bit more grounded getting a little bit more down to earth of like, okay, what do we actually need to do to, to accomplish the goals that we want to accomplish? So there'll, there'll be some of that, that energy going on, you know, definitely people in their lives will be feeling that, that urge to want to get organized. Now, where they'll be feeling that energy in their lives, that's again, dependent on their chart. You know, if they're a Capricorn ascendant, this is going to be hitting their first house. But if they're you know, if they're a cancer ascendant, it, it's going to be hitting their seventh house. So again, this, this is just a general over kind of overview with how it's going to apply to you as individuals it depends on your chart. Um, the next big thing that I, I see here is that we have uh, the sun, Mercury and Mars <clears throat> all in Libra. So a sun in Libra is what we, we tend to call a, a debilitated sun because you think about the sun being the king Libra is a symbolized by the marketplace. So this is like where the king has to go into like the marketplace and deal with like all the normal people. So naturally a king could become like a little bit frustrated there. So, you know, there could be maybe this general energy of, of people <clears throat> feeling like they're not being recognized as much as they want, or they're having to deal with people that they don't really want to deal with. And then Mars and Mercury being combust here can definitely make it to where there might be some some flare-ups or some angry communication. Hmm. So uh, that being said, because Libra is a sign that it deals with communication, relationships, people, all, all that type of stuff. <clears throat> Mars can be kind of our anger and our temper. And Mercury is our communication and our intellect. And both of those are combust, which when a planet's combust, it means that it's it's sitting close to the sun to where the, the sun's brightness because the sun's considered a mild malefic, so it it's because it's so bright, it can it can kind of outshine other things, right? So those things can kind of feel burnt. 
so when you know the sun's in libra here and then mars and mercury are both like combusting libra it can make it to where you know we as individuals may not feel like seen or heard or our opinions are being respected so then there's an angrier communication so this could you know be very you know one way this could play out like within the general context of what we see going on in the world now you know is in regards to a lot of the um the bullshit that's been going on you know that the that the system's trying to pull with this uh with the covid thing and everything that you know people have felt like they've been having to be balanced about things for a while but they're feeling like they're not being heard or they're getting angry about things because they're like no this is not um you know this focus has been so on the collective that we're forgetting the individual rights so people could start getting frustrated for that because you see like mars and libra mars is that like soldier he's that warrior so when he comes in libra this becomes like the soldier that wants to fight for peace or is like that negotiator like that type of thing like even uh, mahatma gandhi he had he had his mars in libra so um you you can see that it's that that warrior archetype so but again it, it's fighting for like what's fair fighting for what's balanced so you know you'll see the energy of people wanting to say stand up and say that like no this isn't okay to just be pushing all of this over over everybody in society like that's that's not okay that's not fair that's not we shouldn't all just have to give up our rights or you know those type of things so you, you could definitely see maybe a lot more resistance to what has been going on starting to you know that that can be coming up um and something that people are feeling and this is it, it's worth keeping in mind that we are moving very close to an eclipse um the 19th we have have one and then uh you know, two weeks after that, we have another an eclipse in Scorpio that's going to going to be a very intense uh, eclipse. Um, you know, something else to look at would be the nodes. You know, Rahu being in Taurus and then K two being in Scorpio. Uh, K two and Scorpio would be the one that I'd really want to put focus on because it's K two is that south node of the moon and it's it's that headless that headless body of the snake in the mythology and i won't get to into the mythology now or anything but it it represents our intuition our inner knowing our higher knowing like things that we've mastered those type of things and it's in a sign of scorpio where it's actually considered to be exalted so it's all about finding the hidden secrets seeing what's really there but doing it through our intuition doing it through our heart space so as this big eclipse comes up this is a massive energy that people are going to be working with and the sun's going to be joining here so they'll be and this will be you know again in mid-december but that energy is going to really build up to where there'll be a lot of revealing or a lot of people kind of like digging within and then actually finding the truth of things or seeing like where where the veil was pulled over their eyes that that type of thing um could be seen as a type of energy that that that's slowly starting to build up now and starting to move into place um you know and again venus you know last little placement is that venus is in sagittarius and sagittarius is a sign that it's all about like finding finding truth finding what's actually accurate and you know venus is the ruler of libra where like the sun mercury and mars are sitting so they're all those planets that are in libra now they're they're going to be drawn towards that type of thing of finding like the truth in the relationships like what's actually going on in the world with how we're interacting with e with each other as human beings like what do we actually need to be doing those type of things so you, you could definitely see there's some very strong energies starting to build up where there's people are doing a lot of thinking about things and then because of that you know that's when that capricorn energy comes in afterwards okay so we're seeing these issues we're seeing these things we need to resolve but how do we how do we get organized and disciplined and figure out how to actually take action on those things so we can achieve what we want that would be kind of a good overall summary of the type of energy that's that we're building up to and will be building up to uh for like the next month or so 
Oh, fantastic, man. That was uh, that was great. That was great. Much appreciated. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, before I, I – the last thing I want to talk to you about is, is, is kind of what we're doing what we're doing here at sure. Pasadena with the, the homestead and the self-sufficiency stuff. But before we get to that, I mm -hmm. noticed um, on and, – and you mentioned that you're separate from the Wizard Factory now, but I was looking at the website today to see what other consultation types of consultations – and you mentioned Nordic earlier, so it makes me think that this is one that you offered. Um, but uh, um, is that Nine World Rune Reading? Is that uh, is that something that you yes, offer? Yes, the Nine okay. World Rune yeah, Reading. Can, can you can yeah, you that, can that you can you tell tell me new. what that is? I've never heard of that, so um, I'm I'm curious. Sure. So the runes are a scholars will try to tell you they were like the Germanic alphabet, but that's simply just <laughs> them not understanding it from an esoteric perspective. If, if to be blunt. Um, but when you look at it, there's – I use the Elder Futh Arc, so the, the Older Futh Arc, and there are 24 runes split into three sets of eight. And you could look at each of those as um, tools for the development of consciousness. If you look at all the runes going from the beginning to the end, they, they're they built like to be an initiation tool, to take a human being and through the learning process, developing like how to how to survive in the physical world – how to develop yourself emotionally and then how to develop yourself spiritually. Those are the different sets of eight. So you, you can look at the runes like that. So each one, much like the planets and the signs has its kind of own essence and meaning and things like that. Then the nine worlds that is based off of what's known as the age Helmer, the helm of awe. And each one of those is associated with a different uh, level of our psyche for you know so there's like you know a conscious mind a subconscious and unconscious and in, in each of these nine worlds so someone will have a question uh and it you know similar to the way like a tarot reading would work you know and you draw and lay out the cards in regards to the question same thing with the runes and i i draw nine runes and i place them there uh the center rune being midgard kind of gives me an overall indication of of the answer and then all the other worlds kind of let me break down the different pieces. But by seeing like which rune falls in which place, that then allows me an interpretation. So very similar to the concept of astrology where like, oh, if, you know, Saturn falls in the uh, the sign of Libra, I can then take the qualities of those and draw an interpretation from that. The same thing, same concept with the runes here. So if I have a rune like um hogalage which means like a uh, hailstorm it's a it's all about transformation and destruction and it's kind of a challenging room and say that falls in the realm of the east in jotunheim well this is a realm that's associated with our ego ourself so in that context i could i could say that oh right now you are going through a transformation of self there is some kind of storm some kind of uncomfortable thing going on and that is making you feel pressure that you're then going through some sort of ego death, some sort of transformation that, you know, that would be kind of just a short, brief example type of thing. So mm -hmm. uh, it's just another occult science, another very useful tool, um, but but absolutely a wonderful science in its own. And I, I, I love doing those consultations as well. So okay. uh, I, I do also have a, a rune course, but I'll, I'll be uh, because I'm rebranding and things like that. I'll, I'll actually be making a whole new one and then releasing that at, at some point. Um, but yeah, nine world rune readings are something that if people are interested in those, um, they can shoot me an email and stuff, and uh, I can do those as well still too. Okay, awesome, very good, very good. Um, so I, I to 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 finish up our conversation here, and yeah, I appreciate all your all your time uh, tonight. It's been yeah been fantastic conversation. Um, so uh, yeah, what we're doing here at Pasadena Self Sufficient Homesteads type stuff. Uh, you're, you said you were doing something similar. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So me and my family, we have uh, 10 acres. We're out in um, a little podunk town out in Kansas that nobody will nobody will know where the fuck it is, but it, it's out there. Um, but yeah, we uh, in short, we're, you know, working on establishing a permaculture farm, uh, both with integrating, you know, uh, livestock as well as like food forest and, you know, in those type of different areas. Um, I just got back out to the property after being away for a few years. So we're kind of in the stage of uh, remodeling a home and getting getting the whole farm up and kind of going again. Uh, but but as far as next year, I have some projects going of, uh, I have one pond that I started a few years ago that I kind I want to dig out, make a little bit deeper and that, that's going to become like an, uh, a natural swimming pool type of area. Mm -hmm. 
um, but also a, a backup water supply because you use the plants to filter all the water. So it, it's good quality water and that's a good emergency resource to have. Mm -hmm. And then I'll also be digging out two other ponds to actually keep, um, you know, like fish and, you know, things like that. And I, I have some other little uh, projects planned for those as those get established and built. Um, and then we'll probably be uh, incorporating livestock, getting some livestock in the spring. Uh, I kind of wanted to hold off on that this year, just so I wasn't having to take care of all the animals through winter. Cause I'm, I'm sure as you know, that can, that can always be challenging sometime. And I've, I've just been very busy this year, but we'll probably be integrating some goats and cattle and, uh, you know, guineas, chickens, turkeys, that type of thing. And then mm -hmm. using, um, using those in a high rotation. So taking the land, you know, splitting it up into say, you know, for example, like acre lots and then, you know, rotating the cattle and the goats through there very quickly, letting them like kind of get it down and then move them to the next one. And then you run the birds in after that. So they, they clean up all the bugs, they spread around the manure. And, and after that, you can actually, you know, just continue to build up that organic matter in the soil and get it better and better quality um as the years go on so those are like kind of our big focuses for next year is incorporating the livestock and getting you know more water sources you know swales built we have a a bunch of fruit trees that we've got to get planted out and you know um blueberry bushes blackberries you, you know those type of things um those will be we're, we're starting on a permaculture force next year with some swales so that'll be kind of another big project so definitely a lot going on on that and um uh, we'll actually have a, a channel coming out for that as well. Um, that'll be coming out like sometime, sometime next year as we, you know, get some of these projects like kind of recorded and get some videos edited and, you know, ready to go for that project. But, um, you know, that, that's something in the future people can kind of keep an eye out for if they're wanting to see the, the progress on the farm and stuff. We'll, we'll definitely be sharing that with everybody as well. Um, and, and I'll also put that stuff up on my profile on the One Great Work Network for, for people who can find me on there. Those I'll have all my different channels and type of content in that central location on there to find. Nice. Some some more self liberational media too. I'm always always happy to hear about that. Um, well that's that's awesome to hear, Absolutely. man. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, we've got we've got we've got goats, lambs, um, chickens, ducks, and turkeys right yeah. now. And a couple of rabbits that, you know, hopefully we'll start breeding soon and yeah, doing a, a lot of the similar stuff. I tried the I tried the uh I tried a lot of the fr the free range stuff for a couple of years with my chickens, but there's just way too many predators. Um, we even had them locked. Like I, even, yeah. I even have yeah. them locked up. Um, and it, like, and it's called the Pasnia bird shanty. Um, but it's 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 just an enclosure mm -hmm. with like chicken fence laid over the top. Um, we even had yeah. rac raccoons kill like six of our birds while that was still on there. So like the predators are so bad in the area that like we could like I as much as I want to do like the free range, like, they wouldn't safe. they wouldn't exist. Like they they wouldn't be there if if, <laughs> if, they, were, if they weren't locked up. So. Sure. It's, yeah. It's no, weird. I I had that same experience. Um, where I had like, uh, in like a two week period, I had like a group of mountain lions take out like, you know, 50 something of my birds at one point, you know, like they just mm -hmm. completely wiped the, the whole population out. So there's, I kind of learned, I have to, you know, you got to keep them safe after that type of thing. Um, but you know, it's all uh, a learning experience, mm -hmm. you know, and you know, as long as we're, we're doing it and we're growing and moving forward, like that's the thing that matters. And, you know, again, like but besides the occult and astrology, uh, permaculture and homesteading that's definitely my next next passion there um you know and you and you mentioned rabbits those are those are great great fertilizer too because you can you just use those as a cold you know uh, or as a as a compost just immediately i mean they make they make you can make great teas with it and stuff like that i used to do that all the time when i had uh, i had rabbits going for for quite a while that i i have to say that was my favorite thing about having them is having access to all the fertilizer <laughs> Yeah, there's, uh, there's, I, I guess one thing I want moving on to the homestead. You, you have a different, a different relationship with shit. That's for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, the, 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 the <laughs> land, it's, it's big piles of compost. <laughs> yeah, it's like oh my, like we've got so we, we've got uh, um, a chicken coop that's repurposed for the lambs and the goats, and like the area that they were in that they spent a lot of time in last year was just obviously full of it, and there's just a big pile of it, and right. you know, I, I, I get a pleasure looking at it, looking at it every day. Like okay, we're, we've got a lot of fertilizer; we don't ever have to import that anymore. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's just it's just you know organic matter that's going to increase the soil and the fertility and the the riches of everything is just processing it and using it properly. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. So um, I, we've been going for, for an hour and 15. I, I, I want to respect your time, not keep you too long, and I, I've actually got to go eat dinner here here shortly. But uh, um, I guess uh, could you uh, you know plug your sites again uh, and then uh, uh, yeah, plug, plug your work again and uh, where people can find you? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the meantime, like right now, like I said, I am, and I am rebranding uh, my website, uh, I of the storm astrology.com. I should have that all done and ready to go by my launch date, but if not, it'll, it'll be up soon after. Uh, but in the meantime, if people do want to get a hold of me, they could just shoot me an email. I of the storm astrology at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. Um, or, you know, find me on Facebook and shoot me a message. You know, I'm, I'm pretty easy to find as far as that goes. Um, and yeah, the, the new channel, you know, I do encourage people, you know, as far as the Wizard Factory goes, we did create a lot of great content on there and everything. Um, so I do do encourage people to go check that out still. There's, there's a lot of value there. Um, but as far as me moving forward in the, in the future, the, the new channel, Eye of the Storm Astrology, will be where it's at. That'll be on YouTube as well as Odyssey and on the One Great Work Network as well. Those will be the kind of three main places that you can find that Um you know, and then I, I share I share stuff on like my personal Facebook page as well, too. So, you, you know, if you add me on there, that that's also another way to get the content. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Brian, any any other closing thoughts before I let you go? Any any anything else you'd like to leave the listeners with on Vedic astrology? Yeah, just really that, you know, don't don't ever shun or dismiss a science until you you've properly studied it and tested it so if you're a person that you've kind of just thought astrology oh no that's just something woo woo that's that's fake and you're basing that conclusion based off of like the little horoscope you see in the paper understand one that's not astrology it, it is a vast science and it takes years of study and research so unless you've done that, don't don't dismiss it. Like be willing to actually look at it with an open mind and be willing to test it. Because if you're willing to do that, you're you're likely to be able to find one of the most valuable tools you could ever apply to your life. And I very much encourage everybody to, if they don't want to study and become astrologers themselves, at, at least be willing to find a professional astrologer whose insight that you value and get a consultation from them and see what kind of insight they can help bring to your life because it it might just be something that that radically shifts the way you look at yourself and your purpose in this world yes yes um and very yeah very very well said um brian thanks so much for coming on man um i really appreciate it and uh, i will uh, um i'll have this up here in the next couple of days i'll, I'll shoot you a link and yeah you can do whatever, whatever you like with it um and we'll have to get you back on uh, back oh, on again because sure. uh, as you as you mentioned uh um yeah as you, as you mentioned uh um, and as we we both kind of alluded to um it's a very very vast science and we we really just uh, kind of uh, maybe maybe a, a little introduction to the to the topic tonight um and uh, some also yes. some also more advanced stuff but uh um all great all great i really appreciate it um brian uh, anything else before i let you go man no not at all thank you for having me on i appreciate the opportunity hey not a problem at all not a problem at all um all right guys uh there you have it uh brian easterday uh a vedic astrologer uh, from I, I the storm astrology i'll put uh, all all the links uh, ways to get in contact with him in the show notes and uh yeah i definitely do uh, definitely do recommend it and uh, i definitely do recommend uh you know uh maybe uh you know yeah op if, if you haven't already if you're listening to this podcast you've already done it but uh, if you're new new coming across this coming across this sort of material um then yeah i mean that the, I've, I've one of my biggest uh, revelations over the past year or two is that i'm not quite sure where the bookends of reality actually lie um so until i find those um i can't just you know outright dismiss things i have to i have to investigate uh, you know all these things and not just believe people believe what i've been i've been told growing up i've got to go out and verify these things myself uh, as the uh, the, the great uh, bill cooper yeah. uh, the now late bill cooper um whose uh, anniversary is past past you know uh, i guess the anniversary of his death four days ago listen everyone read everything believe nothing mm -hmm. unless you get substantiated in your own research and uh, that's a, a great great thing to end out on uh, again pa uh, paznia.com if you want to check out what we're doing here vanupodcast.com for everything vanu and uh liberty attack publications if you're looking for uh, you know, books on, uh, uh, you know, strategy guides, uh, liberation, agor anarchist, agorist fiction, any of that good stuff. Um, that is the site for that. So thanks, guys. Uh, always remember, Vanu is yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. <laughs>